Tonight we're in Chichester. Welcome to Question Time. On tonight's panel, Vicky Ford, a former MEP, elected as a Conservative MP in 2017. She supports Jeremy Hunt in the Tory leadership contest. Louise Haig, an MP since 2015 and Labour's Shadow Policing Minister. Sean Berry, a member of the London Assembly and co-leader of the Green Party in England and Wales. Vote Leave campaigner and now a reporter on the right-leaning online political website Guido Fawkes, Tom Harwood. And personal finance guru, broadcaster and founder of MoneySavingExpert.com, Martin Lewis. to our panel, to our audience here, and of course to you at home. You can join in the conversation as always using hashtag BBCQT on Twitter, on Facebook and on Instagram. Right, without further ado, let's get started with our first question tonight, which is from Harry Peverley. Is lifting the ban on fox hunting a move we should even be considering in 2019? Right, are you sighing next to me, Vicky Ford, I wonder? Because this is also your contender, Jeremy Hunt, who... I don't know why, but he decided to talk about fox hunting uh, today and the fact that he doesn't support uh, a ban on fox hunting and, and would repeal it if he had the choice. So I don't think we should be spending any time talking about fox hunting. I think we've got so much, he much doing bigger it issues to work on. We've got to... Now, hang on. Why is he doing so, it then? So he's also made it very clear that he doesn't want to have a vote on this issue. I don't think we should be spending any time on this issue. We have a set of laws. I don't think we should change them. We shouldn't be go going forward. We've got a huge number of issues to work on. Resolving those big divisions over Brexit. Now, hang on, but everybody so knows that. So absolutely. why did your, your candidate so, bring this up so today? I disagree, and I would have vote, would have said differently. I don't think we should be spending any time discussing this. We've got bigger issues. I don't want to spend a single second of parliamentary time so why discussing do you think this issue. Was it? I think he was answering a question that was put to him, just like you keep no, no, asking no. me the same no, question. No, no. And I've said, Fiona, or we was he trying to on. appeal to the 160,000 no, Tory members, do you is, think? No? He is a person who gives answers to questions. A lot of people get really cross with politicians when they duck questions. When he was asked about how he voted, I think, a decade ago, that's you know, a question he answered. I think we should move on. This is not the time to be spending time, time on these issues. We've got laws on fox hunting. I don't think we should change those laws. I think we need to okay. work on the issues that are actually facing our country right now. Martin. I think the reason he said it is because he cocked up. Right. I is think that what you were trying to say? I think it's simple as that. <laughs> In an interview, he answered a question. I'm not sure even knew what he said, because when he put the transcript out saying it was a way to deny it, the transcript said he did do it. And, look, people are human beings and they cock up. Of course, at the moment, it is absolutely risible for us yeah. to be talking about fox hunting. We have a real problem in British politics. And the problem is Brexit, not about which way it's going, but the sheer amount of political resource civil service resource and regulatory resource, it is leeching out of everything else. Means many real decisions aren't being taken. Just from the ones I'm involved in, there is no law to stop scam ads on social media, which are devastating. We have 120,000 mortgage prisoners who are locked into their mortgage and can't help it. There's the waspy women out there who aren't getting the help they need. And... <laughs> campaign with my money and mental health debt, uh, debt charity that I want to, we're going to mention is we're trying to stop banning debt-threatening letters. And all of these, when you meet politicians and regulators, they go, can't do much because all the resources are in Brexit. So to do fox something would be silly. Mm -hmm. Man there with the glasses. <laughs> Um, Vicky, you mentioned that uh, Jeremy Hunt MP um, is a politician that answers questions, which I find in quite interesting, in that this morning on my way to work listening to Radio 4, Jeremy Hunt, the same Jeremy Hunt, was asked the question directly, yes, no question, do you think fox hunting is cruel? And he started talking about Wi-Fi in rural areas. <laughs> he was then asked again, do you think fox hunting is cruel? He said, my opinion is on record, I'm not going to discuss it. So I would challenge that and suggest that Jeremy Hunt is not a politician that answers questions. <laughs> 
I mean, Louise, the question is about fox hunting, but I guess what is behind it? Is, is, is this the subject that should be being discussed today when there are so many issues facing the country? Well, no, absolutely uh, right. And you put your... Um, you you uh, hit the nail on the head, Fiona, when you said um, he was only appealing to the 160,000 well, Tory party members. My but you were absolutely right. Um, and Vicky's absolutely right that there are so many issues facing the country right now. Disabled people have had £5 billion cut from their benefits. Children with special educational needs are struggling to get an education in school and their parents are having to home educate them. Uh, people are working on zero hour contracts and tonight social care workers having worked a 12 hour shift will go home via a food bank because they can't afford to feed themselves or their family. <laughs> And what are Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt's responses to the challenges facing our country at the moment? Talking about fox hunting, tax cuts for the very richest, tax cuts for corporation, when there is this level of demand, this level of need, this level of vulnerability in our society at the moment, it is obscene, if not immoral, to be talking about tax cuts for the very wealthiest in our society. <laughs> Sean, what was your take on that after the uh, comments made by Mr Hunt this morning? I, w I was aghast. Um, I you know, we settled this question about fox hunting a very, very long time ago. And listening to Jeremy Hunt saying over and over again that he wouldn't condemn it for being cruel was absolutely shocking. And you're completely right. And you're completely right. There are so many things that are being put off. I mean, I'm waiting for renters' rights legislation to yeah. come forward. I work really... Taste? I work a lot, well, eventually. Uh, we're waiting for the domestic abuse bill to yeah. come through. And on the wider issues of public spending, about devolution of money um, to London, I work on housing a lot in London. We're trying to get more money in so we can sort out the affordability crisis within London. Every local area needs to be getting money for council homes. I think the government are half persuaded there is, there is the case to do this, but they're not going to do their spending review for three years. They might do a little bit of stuff in the autumn. At the moment, we are not, we are in paralysis and it's all to do with Brexit. It's the Tory chaos, it's the Brexit chaos. We absolutely need a people's vote to solve this okay, problem. Okay, okay, come on. And we need to get on with solving Britain. John, problem. we may come to that, but let's stick to the question. I mean, no one so far is, is agreeing with Jeremy Hunt instead. So let's just see if anyone is in the audience. The man in the striped top. Certainly not agreeing, no. <laughs> I mean, I just don't understand how we can go back so far where people get joint satisfaction out of watching a fox be ripped up today <clears throat> there's also another part to this and I know for a fact that before the fox hunting season around about now is the cubbing season when they attack cubs to train the hounds up this is what it's all about gentlemen in red coats pretending it is acceptable when it clearly isn't it's incredibly cruel it's about time we forget about it mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, just to continue with the discussion um, there's been a lot of comments by a lot of politicians about not being able to do things because you haven't got time, you haven't got the money. Well, had you dealt with Brexit when you should have done, none of this would be happening now. Yeah. Yeah. The woman in the red t-shirt. No, the woman in the red t-shirt. I mean, there's, there's far more serious issues affecting the countryside than fox hunting. The fact that there are many millions of rural residents and communities living in the locality of pesticide spray crops who have been harmed by such um, um, ongoing spraying is one of the biggest public health scandals of all time. Um, and it's, it's a national disgrace. Successive governments have failed to act on this. Theresa May um, said when she came in she was going to deal with historic injustices and scandals, and she did nothing, nor did her predecessors. And from what it seems from Jeremy Hunt's pledge to give six billion to UK farmers to support farmers post Brexit, nor will her successors. This is an absolute scandal and needs to be dealt with. And it's far more, far more significant and serious than, than obviously the Jeremy Hunt comments on fox hunting. Tom. Yeah, should we be considering this right now? Absolutely not. I, I, I take issue with you, Martin. I don't think that Jeremy Hunt cocked up. I just don't think he's a very good politician. This has happened time and time again. <laughs> He's given an answer to a question. So, for example, he's asked about his views on abortion. He says that we should restrict a woman's right, right to choose. And then he's asked about it again once an uproar's happened. He says, oh, yeah, no, I believe that, but I don't want to do it. 
And then he's asked, uh, what do you think about fox hunting? Yeah, yeah, no, we should absolutely allow that again. And then he's asked again after a bit of an uproar, and he says, yeah, I believe that, but I don't want to do it. This is someone who presumably wants to be prime minister to do nothing that he believes in. I don't quite understand his worldview <laughs> as a politician. Woman in the pink dress. I find it's beyond belief we're actually talking about fox hunting. Um, I think it's actually a psychological and clever ploy because actually we're all talking about Jeremy Hunt tonight. We're all talking about fox hunting. So why don't we just shut it down? Shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> Very briefly. So I do want to come back because I think it is incredibly important that we are also, as politicians, honest. You know, we need to move beyond Brexit. And if everyone had voted... <laughs> I voted, even though I voted to remain in the referendum, I voted to leave with that deal three times. And we would be out of Europe by now. But issues like you just said about people with disabilities, there's more money going into disability benefits than ever before, especially for people who are most disabled. I'm going to tell that and to the 21,000 really, people who've really, died waiting for their PIP It is really important, it is really important that we're honest about these issues. I think when you, when you raise issues and we start debating about money has gone to or money hasn't gone to, I can't cope with the facts as you as a politician raising that. What I can tell you as someone who gets plugged in and lots of messages from people about their money is many disabled people in this country are struggling and desperate and suffering mental health problems because they're not being looked after properly. Mm. You may have put more money in. If that's what the money we put in, and money is the solution, you need to put more in or you need to do it better. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And that is why... That is why... That is... And that is why... There's the, now the largest ever pledge to increase funding in the NHS, especially on mental health, which I mentioned just earlier. It's really benefits, that's not important. An NHS yeah, budget. Yeah, but it's together. It's been, it's been, it's together. Well, talking, really of, important. talking of money, let's come to another question from Jackie Baker. Have the Conservative Party leadership contenders finally located the magic money tree? <laughs> Well, now there's a question, because I've lost count of all the spending pledges, I have to say. They're coming out thick and fast, uh, almost on a daily basis. Um, Sean, what's your view on this? Um, it is interesting to see quite how much money seems to be being spread around, but what is it being spread around on? I mean, this is what I was saying a moment ago, that we need to have a proper, comprehensive review of all our public spending. We need to be looking at fixing the problems that led to the Brexit vote, the, the many communities around the country who need investment, who feel like they were ignored. We need... But, Sean, the question is, is, have the contenders located the magic money tree? No, hang on a second. Thing... We've got to answer the question. The question is, have the leadership contenders located the magic money tree by, money tree by which yeah, they is seem meant... To have, are they all... making pledges that actually are, are fantastical in terms of spending? They, they are making very significant pledges in spending, which they've been saying for many years cannot be spent. So there's, there's at least... And what about the Green parties? Uh, I mean, looking at the manifesto uh, pledges, it was 177 billion of additional spending. Is, is that a magic money tree too? We absolutely... This is a shift in spending. It is a magic um, money from, from, from one thing to another thing. So this is the point. We cannot, at the moment... We need to look at the Conservatives here because we cannot, at the moment, uh, work out our spending plans for our new manifesto. I think you're looking at our 2015 manifesto there because we're waiting for the government to give us uh, a bottom line to work out what they're going to do. We don't know whether we're going to have £56 billion from HS2 or not to be able to invest into council houses. We don't know from the promises that the Conservative uh, contenders are making in terms of tax cuts, what kind of tax regime we're going to inherit in order to make the changes that we need to make. Okay. So it's just, it's complete limbo. And I think if you look at the, the people that the Conservative candidates are trying to woo, it's very, very clear they are only speaking to a very tiny minority, the Conservative uh, Party members out there, um, and they are not even speaking to Conservative voters. If you look back to the fox hunting issue, the vast majority of Conservative Party voters think that fox hunting should stay illegal. They think that the cuts to local councils have gone too far. This is not what we're hearing from the Conservative okay. candidates. They're speaking purely to their membership and it's a very narrow debate. It's not the debate we need to be having about how to fix Britain now. Are we looking at a magic money tree when it comes to the content, the uh, pledges made by 
our leadership contenders. I mean, there's, there's, they range, according to the Institute for Fiscal Studies, from 20 billion to 65 billion. Mm -hmm. Well, I find the whole magic monetary thing somewhat upsetting, because if anyone was going to find it, it should have been me, sure. Ah. <laughs> but, look, clearly they are pledging to spend more, and they are pledging to tax less. If you do that, what happens is you raise the deficit. That's the very, very simple solution. And yet Tory economics, and there's arguments of whether raising a deficit or not, I suspect you might have a slightly different view on that, Tory economics says you don't increase the deficit. And therefore, for me, the plans don't add up. Now, I actually think that we have got a problem in our society that we need to have political classes who are respected. And many of them I meet, while people love to berate them, the individuals are there for the right reasons, doing hard work, trying to improve things. But when you have a campaign like this, which is clearly people talking boulder dash to win elections, which are not manifestos, so they don't have to enact them. I think this brings down the reputation of politics. I would far prefer they were just straight, yeah. honest, costed yeah. and stopped. We've had one campaign where both sides lied. We don't need any more. <laughs> When you, you listen to, the, to the, the spending pledges made, and of course Jeremy Hunt is, is making a, a considerable number himself, how do you fight off the growing sense that, that Boris and Jeremy are saying whatever they think the Tory members want to hear in order to get into number 10? Sorry. Irrespective of whether it's going to add to the deficit, reduce the deficit, affordable, not affordable. So I'm not going to talk about the Boris... Plans. No, well, let's talk about let's Jeremy's plans. Let's talk about Jeremy. So Jeremy's plans is to absolutely super boost the economy so you get a larger economy in has order, he given up trying to reduce in order, the deficit? In order to be able to raise more tax. A bigger economy means more tax. And the way you do that is by supporting businesses, especially through the Brexit period. That's why his tax promises are reducing the tax rate that businesses play because what we've seen both in the history in the UK and in countries like Ireland is when you lower the rate they actually end up doing more business creating more jobs and increasing the amount of tax and then you can spend it on issues like defence we've got a very very uncertain world we need to make sure that we've got robust defence and also on things like hospitals and social care, which are key. You know, Jeremy delivered the largest ever increase in spending in the NHS. And I believe in the NHS and we should support it. And we do that by having turbocharged economy, better jobs, better paid jobs, especially um, so that, that everybody can benefit from this and focusing your tax cuts on helping businesses and helping the least well off, not the best well off. Let's hear if there's lots of hands up. Yes, young man there with the sunglasses, yeah. Yeah, um, I think there has to be an in-depth spending review. I yeah. agree with Sean's point, um, even though I'm not, you know, of that political persuasion necessarily. <laughs> you, you can be. Uh, no, no. I don't have to feel it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to say that. But, lots um, of people are joining. I just think that, you know, it's really upsetting when you're seeing all these things, you know, like uh, knife crime in London, um, the police numbers being cut, but I don't think it's necessarily all, all based on police cuts. Mm -hmm. I think there has to be some other things happening mm -hmm. in society. But I also think that, you know, social care, transport, mm -hmm. all of these different things have to be invested in. You know, just take London, for instance. Mm -hmm. It's got amazing transport and we haven't got anything on par with London. Okay. The woman further back there. I, I believe the Conservative Party have found their magic money tree in that Theresa May agreed the rollout of 5G, which is worth millions, in fact, billions to the UK. So, so you think that's what's going to bring I all think, this money into the economy? Yeah, I do. Yeah. OK, I, I haven't heard them mention that, but young man there in the blue shirt. Um, what I want to know is if Jeremy Hunt's tax cuts don't raise revenue, will you then reverse them? Because, uh, you know, if he's saying it's a pragmatic thing, then surely he'd just reverse them if they didn't work. Do you want to be held responsible for that or, or not particularly big? Or shall I move well, on and get I, some I more? I think that the tax cuts for businesses, um, as I said, it's looking at the rate and not the amount and the lessons that we have from other countries and the lesson of actually what we've seen since the business rate 
tax came, came down here has been really important. But then the other thing, and picking up the point about 5G, it's also looking at the fact that we are in a digital revolution and the unfairness between businesses on the high street and businesses on the internet and the businesses on the high street really struggling with the bricks and mortar business rates that they have to pay. So giving them that support, which I think is really important for our high streets and our towns. Uh, we've talked about Jeremy Hunt at some length here. What about Boris, Tom? What's your view on his spending pledges? Has he found a magic money tree, do you think? I'm not sure anyone's found a magic money tree. I don't quite believe in sort of the Labour Party, Green Party economics like that. Um, but what I would say is there's still a deficit in this country. We still pay £40 billion a year more than we take in in tax. And so that's a problem that's going to need to be solved by whoever comes in. Yes, it's massively down from the over 100 billion a year it was before 2010, but there's still more to do. And yes, uh, debt is falling as a proportion of GDP, but that's not good enough. It needs to be falling in real terms. But also, I do want to agree with, um, with Vicky because there are taxes that you can cut that spur economic growth, that bring in more revenue. There's something called the Laffer Curve, which shows this. There's evidence in terms of this country, in terms of corporation tax, over the last nine years, it's brought in more revenue as the rate has been brought down. If you spur economic growth, you can bring more in. But, I mean, if we're going to start talking about, as, as Sean mentioned, about the uh, about fixing the problems that, that led to that yeah, referendum campaign. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the most important one would be actually leaving the European Union, which I'm not sure you're in favour of. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. How is leaving the European Union going to lead to more investment in the areas that voted to leave? Uh, I mean, if you listen, Caroline Lucas has been visiting leave voting places all around the country. They are crying out for reversals of things like the bus cuts that were mentioned, for more police officers on the street, but also more youth clubs that have been cut back right across the country. How is leaving the European Union going to help us focus on these very, very real problems? Well, very clearly, we're a massive net contributor to the European Union budget. We're the second largest net contributor. literally giving after, me the bus number? After, I'm going to give you, absolutely, there was, a court, there was a court ruling actually just yesterday that found that number is correct, gross, and the, and right, the net right, number, yes. and the net and number is about 10.5 billion year, okay. a year. That's a massive amount, 10.5 billion pounds a year. We're throwing away to Brussels that we could be spending in this country. If you're going to deny that as an argument, you're going to lose another referendum. The question, Jackie's question, have the Conservative Party leadership contenders finally located the magic money tree? Well, it is pretty galling, isn't it, to watch these two contenders um, competing with each other to say how far and how much um, their own cuts that they have voted for consistently since 2010 or 15 when Boris came in. Uh, Jeremy Hunt saying that we've cut too far on social care, despite the fact that he was the longest serving health and social, social care secretary. Boris Johnson, as you say, sir, uh, promising 20,000 additional police officers, having voted for real terms, cuts to the police for the last three years. And you are absolutely right. As a former special constable and as the shadow policing minister, I could talk to you all day about how taking 21,000 police officers off our streets has led to rising crime, and in particular youth and violent crime. But it's not just the number of police officers. It is the wider austerity agenda that has cut youth services, that has cut Sure Start, that has cut all those early intervention measures, which is why the Children's Commissioner has um, put out her report for the third year in a row today, talking about one in five children being vulnerable, one in five children potentially falling through cracks because of the increase in um, the numbers of school exclusions, because of the increase in vulnerability, leaving them very vulnerable to exploitation by criminal gangs, and that's why we are seeing rising violent crime in every community across our country. And that is one of the biggest things that both those leadership candidates should be discussing. Not fox hunting, not cut the tax cuts for the, uh, for the richest. They should be tackling the issue that is meaning that children are dying on our streets. A lot of you with your hands up. Uh, we're going to move on in a minute. But before we do, I just want to tell you that Question Time is taking a break over the summer till oh. Parliament is back. Oh, I can hear you say, Martin. What will you do on your Thursday nights? I don't know. <laughs> Our first programme will be on the 12th of September in Wandsworth. Call 0330 if you would like to be in the audience, or you can go to the Question Time website and you can follow the instructions there. Let's take another question now from Nicola Porter. Was the behaviour of the Brexit M MEPs in the European Parliament this week 
cheerfully defiant or childish and disrespectful. So, so the Brexit MEPs uh, turned their back, didn't they, while the anthem, the EU anthem, Ode to Joy, was, was being played. And Nigel Farage said the party were being cheerfully defiant, and Labour and Peace said they were being childish and disrespectful. Uh, what's your view on that, Tom? Well, there were two stunts, weren't there? The Liberal Democrats turned up with T-shirts with swear words on them, and the Brexit party... We can say that word at this time of night. We can say bollocks. Well, oh, great fun. Yeah. It was, <laughs> it's not the first time it's been said on Question Time, I've got to tell you. So don't get right. too excited. Right. How many times can we say it? Yeah. <laughs> Steady. Right, so the Lib Dems turn up in bright yellow, garish T-shirts, um, disobeying the dress code of any normal parliament in the world, um, and, and, and make their protest that way. The Brexit party turn their backs to an anthem that the United Kingdom actually opted out of in the Lisbon Treaty. One of the reasons why the European Constitution was defeated in France and in the Netherlands and right across Europe, and it was repackaged as the Lisbon Treaty and forced her anyway in true democratic EU style, is because it included all these attributes and trappings of nationhood, a flag, an anthem, presidents. It's quite right to turn your back on that. That's one of the main reasons why we're... you think they could have made their protest in, in perhaps a slightly different way? I don't know what's more dignified than turning up quietly, not making any noise, not being like that man with a silly hat on that stands outside Parliament and shouting at people on the news, not making any sort of um, big uh, display like that, but quietly turning your back to an anthem of a pretend country that's trying to assert itself as a global player, <laughs> that's trying to federalise, that's centralising power, that's taking power away from national governments, taking money away from national governments, only to aggrandise itself with stretch limos for Jean-Claude Juncker, with embassies around the world. World, it's quite right to turn your back to this farce. It's a total and utter farce. A lot of people applauding. A lot of people sitting on their hands, uh, I'd just point out. Um, More people applauding, though, right? Uh, I'm not no. so About sure. 52, I'm not so yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> Vicky, as a former MEP, what was your view? And what do you think the reaction So, I would think have been people then? voted to leave the EU. And we need to leave the EU. By the 31st of October. And that much we know. And but what do you make of, of, of the And if people MEPs? like Louise had voted how I have done, even though I minute, was no, a Remainer, we this wouldn't isn't have remotely the no, question. This is important. The question, no, it, it's this important, is, but it's not the question, I'm afraid. That's, that's the principle of... No, Vicky, that is the principle okay. of question time. So those, was the behaviour of the Brexit MEPs cheerfully defined or childish so, and disrespectful? So those MEPs disrespectful. shouldn't be there. I think that's an important point. You know, we shouldn't have had to have the European elections, and I feel that frustration myself. I, I absolutely understand that. But we are leaving... And when you're leaving, I don't think it's necessary to wind up the people that you're leaving even more. And I wouldn't have done that myself. I might just have not been in the room. But just an unnecessarily winding up just feels rude. We're leaving anyway. I'm there with the long dark hair. I find it quite ironic how Nigel Farage says it's a disgrace that a nation state is imposing this flag and an anthem on them. But that's exactly what the British Empire did on many countries. Yeah, that was bad. That yeah. was bad. That yeah, was bad. Right? The that's EU is also bad. Yeah. Oh. Well, well, maybe not. But whatever. <laughs> that's your opinion, isn't it? The man at the back there in the white T-shirt. Can we get um, on with Brexit? Can, can we trust Boris to do it? Because let's face it, he's going to get in. Uh, that's what every statistic says. Do you think that we can trust Boris with Brexit to get it on and give the country the closure it needs? OK, well, that is a big question. I might just for the moment stick with the question that we were asked uh, originally, if, if that's all right. Uh, Sean? I think, I mean, I, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the Brexit party's stunts, because I think that's what they're there to do. They're there to, to cause disruption, to cause... Uh, offence as much as they possibly can. Look at the speech, the horrible speech that Anne Widdicombe gave today. Mm. Um, and I think it's embarrassing to the MP, MEPs who were there. You're to referring actually... to the speech you made about, about yeah, the I think all of this slaves is... throwing yeah. off chains and. It, 
yeah, drawing comparison very, very with Very, very offensive. Um, and I think, you know, these, these stunts, that we should be focusing on what they're not doing, which is their jobs. It's embarrassing to the MEPs, like the seven Green MEPs, who are there now, joining committees, turning up to things to get things done. Did you know that Nigel Farage, in the last European Parliament term, turned up to one of the 42 fisheries meetings that he was yeah. down to do? Sure. The Green MEPs are going to be working there. Um, and I think it's really important that we pay attention to what they don't do. And look at the um, Parliament today. They did exactly what the UKIP MEPs have been doing for a very long time, the Brexit MEPs. They turned up, they collected their money, and they went off to the pub. Mm. <laughs> I don't know if they did go off the pub. The woman there in the, in the blue. It is childish for them to all have stood up and turned around. If I did that to the national anthem, I'd be a traitor to my country. Mm. Um, although, you know, people say, you know, the European Union, it's bad. For the time being, we're in it. For the time being, we need to respect every other member state. And by alienating the member states, exactly like what happened during Brexit, the Remain side started to alienate the Leave yeah. side, the Leave start started yeah. to alienate the Remain side, and then what do we have? We have people who are against each other, we have friendships, families being torn yeah. apart. Exactly. I remember my own family, on the day that we got the results of, me and my brother, uh, we found out that our parents had voted Leave, and we were like, what the hell have you done? You've absolutely screwed us. And in all honesty, that's our family. We shouldn't be... We shouldn't be there to be at war with our family. We shouldn't be there to be at war with our allies, because at the end of the day, when all doors are shut, if we do go into another world war and we've alienated all these member states, it's going to be us versus the world. Since no one's going to want to help sorry. us. Well, we, we're still in NATO. I don't think anyone's suggesting we leave right, NATO. So, so, since when did pro-Europeanism become about flag-waving jingoism? That sounded like a Trump rant. That sounded like the US, where people um, shout down at, I don't know, African-American athletes for taking a knee to the national anthem. Taking protests against national anthems is fine when you don't recognise the legitimacy of that nation, and it is trying to become a nation. Well, That's the point. Hold on, hold on. That's hold on. You're, you're just a little bit rude. It didn't sound like a Trump ramp. It sounded like someone who didn't want our political classes to alienate. Whether you're a Brexiteer yeah. or a Remainer, I don't see the other European Union countries as an enemy, and I hope we won't no, see that. No, no, that's totally different. Sir, no, no, no. Sir, so, my view is, absolutely. whatever you think, these are our neighbouring countries who we want to get on with, and I understand the frustration of the Brexit MPs because they've been elected to represent a constituency who are deeply frustrated, but I thought it was childish, as with the Lib Dem bollocks on the T-shirts, childish. I want better from all of our politicians. Mm. Louise. <laughs> and then I'll come to more of you in the audience. Louise. Well, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. It was an incredibly childish act, and it, and it is acts like that and the speech that Anne Widdecombe gave today that have pushed people away, that have hollowed out any room for, for consensus and has forced people to take very extreme views, quite frankly, and is why Brexit has taken so long to resolve. It's why we've not been able to reach a deal that has worked across Parliament. Um, and and this, this woman is right. You know, politicians should be working to reach out to, um, to form consensus and to reach compromise, and it feels like everything is being pulled apart, everything is getting harder to do. So the idea that Brexit could be resolved by Boris Johnson, I think, is, is quite unlikely. The, the only possible way that that can happen is crashing out on a no deal on the 31st of October, which would be absolutely damaging to our economy, to our security, to our manufacturing industry, and to our future as a, as a society. The reason why okay. Brexit has happened... very briefly, it's really it's the reason why Brexit hasn't happened is because Parliament looks like this panel. There are four of you who voted Remain and just me who voted Leave, and that's about There's the There's only one well. person in this panel who is campaigning to Remain. I'd just like to point uh, right, out, which is Sean. But I think what we've discovered about the last three years is that how you voted in the referendum actually matters. And however many times you say that no deal is better than a mad deal, you actually have to mean it. <laughs> Let's take another question because we've had so many in this evening, and I want to try and get around as many as I can, which is from Danny King. Um, with obesity-related cancers on the rise, is this really the right time to be reviewing the so-called sin tax? Mm -hmm. So this, of course, is... Uh, I mean, it's Boris Johnson's phrase. Uh, I think it was his phrase, the sin tax. So he was talking about um, scrutinising things such as a sugar tax. I think that's what you're referring to, the soft drinks industry levy, which was introduced last year. Uh, though he's not going to look at alcohol or, or tobacco. W what's your view on this, Louise? 
Well, I think with anything, um, with any public policy issue like this, you've got to look at who's supporting it and why, and who's opposing it and why. And the people that support it are the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, mm -hmm. the Secretary of State for Health, the Shadow Secretary of State for Health, um, and the University of Sheffield in, in my home city has done research on it and shown that it has led to a 30% reduction in the sale of sugary drinks. And in fact, it's had the biggest impact on the sale of sugary drinks to children. So as that gentleman has just said, in the week when it's been released by Cancer Research UK, that obesity is the second largest contributor to cancer after smoking, I think we should be doing everything in our power to tackle that crisis. But let's look at who opposes it, the sugar industry. And who are they involved with? Boris Johnson's campaign. So this is Boris uh, no, Johnson. Allegedly. Uh, well, okay, okay, okay. All right. Let's make your pardon, Fiona. Allegedly involved with Boris Johnson's campaign. Mm -hmm. From my perspective, this is Boris Johnson nakedly speaking on behalf of multinational corporations and not in the, in favour of our children's health. But also another big question for Boris Johnson as with so many policy issues, is which Boris Johnson are we dealing with? This week we're dealing with the Boris Johnson that's opposed to the sugar tax. In 2015, when he was Mayor of London, he supported the sugar tax because he said it tackled and was needed to tackle childhood obesity. This is a man behind the bluff and bluster who has ducked and dived on every single public policy issue going in order to put himself in the top job. The one thing we know about Boris Johnson is you can't trust a single word he says. I've tried to think quite hard through this one because I do have instinctively the idea that if people are going to drink this by putting a tax on it, that means people pay more and that means it could be regressive because generally when you put taxes on products, it's regressive and the poorer people pay a higher proportion of their income on them. I actually think the biggest success of the uh, sugar tax is about the reformulization of drinks that many of the drinks that were previously sold have been reformulated. Now, I think that's crucially important. And there are other ways than taxation to do it. One is you could force all the over-sugared drinks to have cigarette types warnings on the can. Not necessarily because it would stop people drinking them, but it would stop the brand specialists at those companies saying we're going to have to change this because otherwise we're going to have to put these horrible things that kill our brand on the front of our cans and they're going to talk about it in the rest of the world. So I'm, I'm ambivalent as to whether it's done by a sugar tax or another effective method, what's most important is we reduce the amount of sugar and help obesity. Mm. So I'll, I'll, I'll sit on the fence in a positive way to say that <laughs> we need to do something, but there are other options, but as long as those other options will work. Man at the back in the glasses. <laughs> well, I quite, I quite agree to, to the panel on this debate. But however, I just wanted to say, we were speaking about growing economies and Louise said about Boris Johnson avoiding policies. I want to know what's the policy for off labor, for example, when the UK doesn't have an access to the EU labor market for non-EEA uh, non skilled laborers. We want to come in, we want to contribute, we want to pay taxes, which will help grow the economy, but we are not allowed because we have a very high threshold on our work mm. visas. Students, international students, don't get a post-study visa, for example. I'm an international student. I want to stay in this country. I want to contribute to the economy. I want to make sure everything works, but I don't have any op opportunity to do that. Now you're making a very interesting point. We're talking about the sugar tax for now, if you'll he forgive me. So I'm just gonna, he, needs he, needs a, he needs a sweetener. So I'm just going to stay on that for a minute, if, you, if, if I may. It's the man here at the front. I just want to sort of turn it around a little bit. I'm in advanced stages of renal cancer. And the consensus is that that's... Sorry, you said you are? Yes, I am. I'm very um, sorry to hear that. No, no sympathy, thank you. Um, <laughs> it's generally considered from the people I've talked to that it's due to sort of excessive drinking of a, how shall I say, a cola brand of the diet variety. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, maybe I should have stuck to drinking the uh, full proper sugar. full <laughs> sugar, been diabetic, fat, but I'd still be alive next year. You can look at it from both ways. Yeah. <laughs> a woman at the back then. Um, the question of the question of ob obesity is is an important one today, and maybe it's not about 
drinking too much sugary drinks, but getting more exercise. And if exercise was safer, if there were more safe cycle paths from town to town, children would cycle to school and they would get the exercise instead of always being driven because it's not safe for them to be on the roads. Uh, Tom, yeah. while some of the panel here were talking about the benefit of sugar tax, you had your head in your hands and you were shaking your head. I, I mean, it's extraordinary. You pointed to a study that was a prediction not about outcomes, it was a prediction. And the prediction turned out not to be true. Wherever there have been studies, long-term studies, about the effects of these things, particularly in the United States of America, what they found is people switch to different brands. They switch to cheaper brands, they don't buy less of the stuff. What Boris's policy isn't to end the sugar tax, it's to have the first proper review into the effects of the sugar tax. And I can't believe that I've just heard practically everyone in the panel just oppose evidence-based policy like that. You're proposing faith-based policy, not evidence-based policy, and we should want to see the evidence before we make sweeping changes like this. I mean, I think the man in the front row made the best point of the evening. It reminded me of the diesel scandal, where the EU told us that diesel cars were brilliant. They subsidised them, they said that we all had to drive diesel cars, and what do we find out a few years, um, a few years ago? Suddenly, diesel is, is the worst thing in the world and we shouldn't be using it. Perhaps we shouldn't be so quick to make these government-imposed judgments about how we should live our lives. And the idea of plain packaging for chocolates or for drinks, I think, is just authoritarian nonsense. Vicky? So, obesity is a killer. And actually, I'm really, really sorry to hear about your cancer, but obesity is now the, the largest cause of kidney, renal cancers, liver cancer, bowel cancer. And one in three adults is considered obese. One in four children leaving school is considered obese. And I think the first job of a government is to look after the security. And within security, I include the health of the people. But is there any the evidence sugar tax, that the sugar tax The works? sugar tax is working. In terms the of reducing amount, obesity? The amount of sugar that is being sold in the UK has dropped by over 10%. Not because people are paying more, but because, as you said, the manufacturers have reduced the amount of sugar the that they're putting in up. products. But the sugar consumption is coming down. That's now, the, the other good thing about this tax is that the money from the tax is going into school sports. So, actually, it's encouraging the fitness as well. So, I think it's an important tax. And I think it is important that we work on prevention in our health care to make sure that we're a healthier population. And I don't think this is a nanny tax. I think this is good government. Sean? So, yes, we, we do have to ask why Boris is spending time... This was the original question, was, was why are we spending time looking at a policy that seems to be working, that's perfectly sensible, that people support, um, when there are bigger things um, to worry about? And when we've got this strong evidence that's just come from cancer research that it's an important cause of cancer. Now, I... That obesity But is. does it work? That's but the question. I, but, I, but... 10%. So, with Boris, I mean, you, you do have to worry why he's doing this, but I see this on the London Assembly. The Conservatives on the London Assembly have spent an inordinate amount of time attacking the Mayor of London's perfectly sensible ban on junk food advertising on the Tube. Now, this is related, and I don't know why they're doing it either, but we, we, should, we should be told. You mean the one that bans um, pesto, this is related. olive oil? This the is one related that... to the, um, the adverts that came out today, because the cancer research campaign, although I, don't, I think it's a little clumsy, and I'll talk about this in a second. But think, hang on, you're talking about the, 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 the advertising, the, the cigarette, cigarette packets packaging with obesity written the across The warning. I think, it, I think it does. I don't like the idea that people who have cancer are to blame in any way for, for anything that they've done, and I don't like that at all. But they are asking for a ban on adverts or for junk food before 9pm, and this is perfectly sensible. The sugar tax has worked, and it has worked by getting the manufacturers to change their behaviour. That's how the has advertising it obesity, changes Sean? would work as well. Is, has it reduced, it's reduced obesity the of anyway? sugar that we've eaten um, by 90 million kilograms, and that's primarily through reformulation by the manufacturers, and that's a worthwhile thing to do. And we have to look at, in terms of obesity, the environment that we live in and how much it contributes. So the lady there saying, why can't we walk and cycle safely, um, is completely right. We're, why are we getting rid of green spaces to do physical mm. exercise? And you say that we should need to be investing in public health and physical education. Well, all the money from the sugar tax is not yet 
that was promised is not yet going into physical education. And public health grants have dropped by half a billion pounds, thanks to your government. And Boris now, these things need investing in too. And if more yeah. sugar taxes are the way to get you to do them, then I think that's a really good idea. <laughs> and on the biking, let's remember Boris did bring in the Boris bikes. Ben Livingston idea <laughs> that came from Paris and were planned well in advance of yeah. Boris coming in. He doesn't have good ideas, everyone knows that. <laughs> I'm going to take a couple more, couple more points and then I'm, I'm going to go on to another question. Yes, the woman in the glasses. I think we're confusing obesity and sugar as it being one issue. Sugar is carcinogenic. I'm a cancer patient, but so is aspartame. Unfortunately, the UK are light years behind other countries in the world who are well aware that there are safe sugar substitutes. The problem is they're more expensive mm. than aspartame. And until we can move towards those things and get better production of them and persuade by whatever means the drinks manufacturers, soft drinks manufacturers and candy manufacturers and so on, one of the things I've noticed is that in, for people who have food allergies, if you look at the free from ranges in the supermarket, the top ingredient in all those products is sugar. And we need to start thinking seriously about sugar, r r irrespective of its effect on our weight. I'm going to take another question from John Murray. There you are. Is it time the Labour Party turned its back on Jeremy Corbyn? <laughs> Now, there was, um, Louise, I'm going to come to you first. I mean, there was a, 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 a poll that came out uh, this week showing Jeremy Corbyn's approval ratings were pretty low. In fact, according to this poll anyway, uh, the worst of any leader of the opposition since 1978. What do you think to that question? Um, I understand why people have been frustrated um, that um, it's taken us some time to come to a position on Brexit. Um, it's been frustrating for some of us as well, but that's because we, we've been trying to reach consensus um, across our movement with our members and with our trade union partners. And I think uh, we have uh, been watching the Tory party fail to reach consensus and been learning lessons there. Um, and I was pleased to see Jeremy Corbyn call um, explicitly for a second referendum uh, in Prime Minister's questions yesterday, because we have reached an impasse now in Parliament. He hasn't said what the Labour position would be. He said we, uh, we will absolutely have a second referendum. No, what the Labour position would be in the second oh, referendum, in the, in the, as in you the, well know, in the second <laughs> Well, I mean, I would be campaigning to remain. I still believe um, that that is the best, um, best possible deal, that we have the best possible deal. All the economic impact assessments have shown um, exactly that. Um, and I think, you know, it was one poll um, that was uh, kind of out of step with, uh, with several of the other polls that have been published this week. Um, but I would say that because um, we've taken a little bit of time to get there, that's probably had, had an impact. But I think now that, we are, uh, now that we are absolutely clear that we will be campaigning for a second referendum, uh, I, think that will, I think that will boost us back again. Mm. Can I just, John, where, where about are you? Is that what was, what was behind your question, Labour's position on Brexit? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no definition or a de definitive um, method of getting Brexit over the line. No. And it's clear, even within the Tory party, that there will be a general election, come what may. And he looks like, Boris Johnson looks like, he's been selected for the man to defeat Jeremy Corbyn. Mm. So, as an inherent Labour supporter, as somebody who doesn't see and identify with Jeremy Corbyn as a leader, but as an important politician, we need somebody with the cream that can come up and head-to-head -head Boris and defeat him. Because he wasn't your first choice either, Louis, was he? Because you back to Owen Smith in 2016. Can, can I just ask, since you're here, mm. um, there were reports in, in, in a newspaper, in the Times newspaper, with senior civil servants questioning Jeremy Corbyn's mm. uh, fitness around the country, and, and Labour kicked back very strongly against mm. that. There were also other reports that he had had a mini stroke. I just wondered if you could enlighten us as to whether that's true or no, not. No, I mean, look, our civil service is, is one of the best, uh, most impartial in, in the world, but it, is, it was horrifying uh, to read uh, the, the allegation that senior civil servants could have been briefing um, 
baseless allegations uh, to the media um, about Jeremy Corbyn. I, uh, I was with him yesterday, he is fit and well. Um, and the only people that should be making those judgments and choosing who our next Prime Minister is and choosing who is the best person to beat Boris Johnson are you, the British public. And you will be faced with that choice at the next general election. You will be chased with, faced with two competing visions. One, Boris Johnson, who, as I mentioned earlier, is a known liar who has twisted and turned <laughs> on every public policy position going, who takes advice um, from far-right uh, white supremacists associated with Trump's White House, um, and Jeremy Corbyn, well, who is the best. Oh. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What do you think when you get a reaction like that? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not 100% I'm not sure what... Um, Steve Bannon is known to have been associated with, um, with Boris Johnson. He is known to have advised him. That is absolutely without... I don't know what you're shaking Bullocks. your head at, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's not go overboard with that word. Total nonsense. They, had one, they had one meeting ever. Why when, would you meet he with was, Steve Bannon? Because he was the foreign secretary and Steve Bannon was in the White House as the chief advisor to the, pres as advisor of the, to the president of the United States. That's when they met. And then Steve Bannon comes over to uh, the UK, I think, two years and ago. And said he went back and, and forward on Boris Johnson's narrative. No, he didn't. That was actually a mistranscribed, mistranscribing yeah. by a Guardian journalist. If you, if you listen to the audio in that clip, he's saying they went back and forth over text trying to organise a meeting, a meeting that never happened. This is Steve Bannon, who tries to meet with every politician, and a lot of them turn him down these days, and for good reason. Boris didn't. He did. But, um, he did, he did uh, let's, him in this country. Know, I think let's... I mean... Oh. Let's, let's deal with the question at hand. <laughs> Call me old-fashioned. Uh, is it time the Labour Party turns back on Jeremy Corbyn? Martin. I think there are many people in this country at the moment who don't want a Boris or a Jeremy of either flavour to leave. <laughs> And I think that means there is room for somebody else within the Labour Party, certainly. Having said that, the question you have to ask is which Labour Party? Because like the rest of our political parties, they are in schism. And there are many people in the Labour Party for whom Jeremy Corbyn is absolutely the wrong leader because they don't believe in what he believes, and that includes the MPs. And there are many people in the Labour Party for whom Jeremy Corbyn is absolutely the right leader because they come with the same politics. And unfortunately, the way we work our political system in this country, where we have two major parties that are adversarial, out to fight each other, it's all tit for tat, leads us to be in a mess. And if we, I, I've been trying to restrain myself for going on Brexit. But the one thing I would say on this is actually people criticise Parliament for the way it's handled Brexit. Parliament over Brexit has been a perfect representation of the national division. And because it's a perfect representation of the national division, Division, which is it is incredibly close on what people think it has been stymied. And we're having the same problem as being reflected with our parties, which are stymied because they have the same division of the rest of society. And I'm not sure what we're going to be able to do to fix it, but we do need to fix it. So it's a division we see in audiences week after week. Yes, the man, you're frantically waving your hand at me, so let's hear what you've got to say. What, me? How, how, can, how can we have a Prime Minister like Jeremy Corbyn, who shows absolutely no respect for the Queen or the armed forces. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I think he'd take issue with that. Uh, the man there in the grey T-shirt. Uh, this probably won't be very popular, but I believe that Jeremy Corbyn is the Labour Party. I think he's been an MP for 35 years, and then if you look back at his voting history of what he's done and everything that he, he stands for, he's a decent man, and I think we all need to really give him a chance and not read what's written in the papers. Sean. And I'm, I'm party co-leader myself. Um, it isn't for me to, to comment on the leadership of the Labour Party specifically. I will complain about the leadership we've seen, or the lack of leadership we've seen from the Labour Party on some of the big, biggest issues that we've, we've seen. We've had complete confusion over their Brexit policy for such a long time. On, on climate change, they, they are not putting forward the ideas that, that they should be. And I'm so proud of our party at the moment. I'm a co-leader uh, and we have so many good people out there showing 
showing real leadership. We won a whole load of new council seats precisely because of the clarity of our message saying yes to Europe, no to climate change, let's fix Britain. And, and we are out there doing that. We've got uh, councillors on 109 different councils now have passed climate emergency motions, a lot of those due to green, green councillors. And Greens are shifting the balance of power in so many councils. There are 15 councils now where, where Greens have got elected alongside um, but hang on, you're not, on, you're not on here to do a party Labour. political broadcast. <laughs> we're working with other parties. We're the grown-ups in the room here. We're not. We're a united party, and we're not rowing amongst ourselves. Um, and we are there putting together groups that are, that are toppling Tory councils, that are starting to reverse cuts on councils. We're actually out there doing the work. So, yeah, I can't comment on who should be leader, but I just wish there was more leadership and less confusion and less chaos from, from both the big parties here, because we are winning votes for okay, it. OK, Sean, um, we hear you. But it's, but it's we, not hey, a good show from them. You. It is not. Uh, Vicky. So, I am not concerned about his physical fitness, but I am completely concerned about his policy fitness. I'm terrified by the hardest hard-left Labour government that I've seen in my lifetime. <laughs> this, week, you know, this week, they've announced a policy which would literally take people's homes from them and stop them passing them on to their children. This is a guy who cozies up to Moscow. Do you really trust him with our nuclear deterrent? And it's him and the people around him. And I think we are at a deeply uncertain period in world history. We have the most complicated negotiations of a generation that we have to close and resolve soon. And we need to have a leader who is trusted and competent on the international stage. And that is not Corbyn. Yeah. We've got a couple of minutes left. So I just want to get around as many of you in the audience as I can. So be reasonably brief, if you don't mind. Yes. Yes, uh, I'd just like to say the word respect. Um, so I'm a member of the Armed Forces and we have uh, one of our values and standards is respect for others. Um, I think at the moment the two political leaders um, in Boris Johnson and, and Jeremy Corbyn um, don't seem to show much respect. And we spoke about this earlier, about children showing respect um, and families and parents. Um, but actually, with Jeremy Corbyn whispering what he was suggested to have whispered in Parliament, to Theresa May, I think Boris Sorry, Johnson. What are you referring to? Stupid woman. The the oh, whisper, woman. the whisper that he made in Parliament towards <laughs> Theresa May in referring to maybe calling her a stupid woman. Um, I think Boris Which Johnson, with some of the things that he said as well, um, as maybe have not shown the respect um, that a politician should have. So you said more respect overall. <laughs> woman there in the blue dress. Uh, we have 382 constituencies, and of which. 270 voted to leave. The majority of their cons constituencies voted. Why are the MPs not voting as their people did? And why are they not representing their people in Parliament? The man in the yellow T-shirt. The man in the yellow T-shirt. Thank you, yes. Um, I'd like to respond to what Louise said. Uh, she talked earlier about uh, extreme positions on Brexit. I th would you accept that remaining is an extreme position on Brexit? The country had the referendum. The country voted to leave. Not leave with a deal or leave without a deal. That's a separate issue. But we voted to leave. Therefore, parliamentarians taking up a position of remain is totally extreme. It's just de defying the people. It's co completely outrageous. <laughs> exactly why we voted to trigger Article 50 and that's exactly why I voted for several forms of Brexit in the last three years. I voted for our deal, I voted for a Norwegian type deal, but it's not been possible to deliver a deal that gets through this Parliament. So the most likely outcome, I believe, is no deal on the 31st of October and I stood on a manifesto that clearly ruled out no deal in 2017 and ruled out voting for a deal that wouldn't protect jobs, workers' rights and environmental standards and that's why I believe the best thing to do would be if you want to vote for a no deal and you want to leave on those terms then you need to tell us on, and, and have an, a second vote on the terms of how we leave the European you. Union. You. Okay. Can I? All there. you need to do Louise is vote for the deal. Three times they have blocked don't it. Want that deal. Three times. Don't want then that we deal. need to get a better deal but we do need to leave and three times you and the Labour okay. MPs and many of it. your MPs. Three OK, times. our panel is split, our audience is split and our time... That's a reflection of the country, which is exactly what you are, and our time is up. 
I'm so sorry, there's so many hands up. We'll be back in September uh, in Wandsworth. Mind you, the way politics are going, who knows, we might be back earlier. <laughs> uh, so don't hold me to that. Um, call 030 123 if you'd like to be in the Question Time audience uh, over in September, uh, or you can go to the Question Time website and you can follow the instructions there. And if you want to have your say on tonight's topics, and certainly I think a lot of talking will be going on uh, after we go off air, you can join Adrian Charles and guests on uh, Question Time, Extra Time, and that is on Five Live right now. But for now, thank you to my panel, thank you to all of you here, and thank you to you at home for watching and listening. From Chichester, bye-bye. <laughs>